one way to look at meditation is as a type of medicine that we take. It's actually interesting if you hear about the origin story of mindfulness-based stress reduction, the technique that was developed by John Kabat-Zinn and others. It was developed at the UMass Medical School in the basement of UMass. And it was developed in response to people that were being sent down to work with their experience in a different way, who had things like chronic pain or chronic illnesses, terminal illnesses, um, things that were very difficult and weren't really responding to other treatments well. And so mindfulness-based stress reduction was in some ways developed initially as a profound and powerful medicine for people who, for other, uh, other medicines weren't working for. Um, and really, mindfulness, uh, secular mindfulness is understood in part as a medical intervention at this point, psychological and medical. Um, if you go even further back to the roots and origins of mindfulness practice, back to the Buddhist um, school, one of the first teachings of Buddhism is what's called the Four Noble Truths. And these four truths follow the classical Indian medical model. Um, the first noble truth is the diagnosis. The second has to do with something called the ideology, where it comes from. The third is the prognosis. Um, here's what you can expect. And the fourth noble truth is the prescription. Here's what you need to do to cure the illness. So very interesting that meditation um, in some ways has always been kind of linked, especially um, mindfulness-based meditation to medicine in a way, a way of curing illness. One of my uh, early meditation teachers was a medical doctor, emergency room doctor named Daniel Ingram. And one thing he pointed out early on is that meditation, um, like any other medicine, really should have a warning label. Um, I mean, meditation, especially when you're doing a lot of it, has some profound side effects. Um, and not all of them are positive. Some of them are negative. And so he, he kind of pointed out, like, imagine the ethics of being a medical doctor and giving someone a prescription, a powerful drug, and not telling them what the potential side effects could be. He said, these practices really should come with a warning label. And I think if we look back and see meditation as a medicine, which is always, um, at least with Buddhist meditation and mindfulness practice, always how it's been framed anyway, then we really should be thinking about what the warning label is on meditation. And as I said, these practices have side effects. One of the side effects of mindfulness practice is an increased sensitivity to experience and a consummate dissolving of our current identity structure. Sometimes the Buddhists talk about this in terms of having insight into selflessness, to seeing that the self, who we took ourselves to be, is not who we actually are. And as one practices to see um, how the self, how our identity, is not what we thought it was, which is one of the primary purposes of mindfulness practice, then our sense of who we are begins to dissolve. It begins to actually crumble. And what's interesting and what uh, I guess many people don't really talk that openly about is that this can bring up some periods of existential grief, of existential anxiety, and of existential-based depression. And I want, to men I want to talk about all three of these and kind of what they look like and what we should be looking out for as we practice. But I also want to mention before that these side effects are very connected to the amount of meditation we do. In medical language, we'd say they're very dose dependent. Um, it's important to recognize the more one practices, the more likely these side effects are going to happen. Um, that said, and this is also a really interesting point. Sometimes for some people, just a little bit can actually cause some pretty severe side effects. Some people are more sensitive to meditation, to the side effects. So it's really important that we talk about this stuff and be open about it and talk about these existential side effects. And by existential, just to be clear, I mean those things that are related to and tied up with our existence, with our beingness. This is a quote from the Tibetan Buddhist teacher Chagyam Trungpa. He says, treading the spiritual path is painful. 
It is a constant unmasking, peeling off of layer after layer of masks. It involves insult after insult, he says. Treading the spiritual path is painful. It's a constant unmasking, peeling off of layer after layer of masks. It involves insult after insult. So what are these masks? These masks, as he's describing them, there are provisional identities. They're who we think we are at that point. A quick example of this is when I was running a project called Buddhist Geeks, um, which I ran for about 10 years along with other people. Um, I really became so passionate about the project and so wanted to succeed and became so interested in, in what I was doing and who I was talking to and the purpose of it that um, I really merge my identity with the project. And this is very common um, for people who start new things, entrepreneurs. It's also common if you're a parent and you have a child. You really, uh, the things you care most about, you merge your identity with them. You create a new kind of mask around it that becomes, um, doesn't even feel like a mask. It doesn't feel like something um, that you're wearing. It feels like who you are. So for me, when uh, Buddhist Geeks ended, or was as it was starting to end, I really noticed all this grief and pain and fear, all these things coming up that I thought, oh, wow, like, where is this coming from? Why is this happening? What is wrong with me? Um, and it took me a little while to realize that, oh, this is yet another mask, yet another identity that I formed that is now dissolving. Um, and it's something that I've got to work with. What's interesting with the grieving process, though, and what's interesting about losing these identities is that we go through often periods of great sorrow. Chagyam Trungpa again called this tapping into the ocean of sadness. Grief is a natural process when we lose something close to us or someone dear to us. But it's a process that we actually have to go through. So existential grief uh, it's one of the most um, imp- one of the most important side effects to be aware of with meditation. If we really are doing the practice correctly and we see through these masks, then as Trungpa said, it's insult to who we thought we were. It's a death to who we thought we were. And there's a grieving process that happens as we lose those masks. They're not ultimately who we were, but they felt like who we were. And so we have to grieve their loss. Another of the side effects I mentioned is anxiety, existential anxiety. When we practice meditation, we're often asking fundamental questions. We're inquiring into, investigating our experience, asking questions that perhaps, you know, we only asked when we were quite young. Like, who am I? What is this? Why is, this? Why is reality like this? And when we ask those questions, part of what we're doing is we're opening into a space of not knowing. We're uh, putting aside what we think we know, and we're becoming curious, and in a sense, we're we're becoming open to not knowing, to uh, not having a ground beneath us. This groundless way of not knowing us actually, especially initially, can open us to a deep sense of anxiety and fear. Because when we don't know what we thought we did, suddenly we don't know where to stand. And without somewhere to stand, it's just a natural human instinct to feel scared, to feel anxious, to worry about what's gonna happen. That's part of the reason I think we have the tendency to, um, to be so certain about what we think we know, because we like having that stability underneath us or that feeling of stability. The problem is it's not actually stable. One story that I heard Joseph Goldstein share while I was on retreat with him, this insight meditation teacher, um, is a story of the skydiver. And the skydiver is a metaphor for the process of meditation, and it highlights the anxiety um, that I'm mentioning that can arise, that great fear. And in the story of the skydiver, the skydiver um, is first going up in the plane, um, getting ready to jump. Um, the preparation, all that involves. Then there's the process where the skydiver actually takes the leap out of the plane. And, um, you know, of course, there's, anxi- there's nervousness, but there's also excitement. It's like, oh, yes, I'm finally doing this. and I'm taking the leap. Um, 
then in the story of the skydiver, imagine that as the skydiver is falling, they realize that they didn't actually um, put on their um, parachute or that the parachute is broken. Okay, then imagine the existential anxiety and fear and terror that could arise in that situation. But what's so cool about this and why, um, again, this is a side effect of something we should be aware of, but it's not ultimately something that that should um, derail the process of meditation or keep people from trying it or doing it, is that uh, the skydiver in the story realizes at a certain point, even though they don't have their parachute, there is actually no ground. There's nothing that they're going to ultimately hit. So they're really just floating through, falling through empty space with no ground to hit. And how this actually manifests in practice is that at some point we realize as we're opening to this more and more groundless experience of not knowing that in fact the fear and the anxiety that are arising in response to recognizing that are themselves groundless. When we realize that it's not just this or that that's groundless, it's everything that's groundless then there can be a deeper sense of relaxation and ease that starts to come online. But before that happens, it's often the case that there's a great amount of terror and fear that is tied up with our sense of existence. The last uh, side effect that I wanted to mention in more detail is depression. Part of what happens in meditation, part of what I've experienced is that as we go deeper, and this is what I mentioned before, we're increasing our sensitivity to our human experience. We're increasing our awareness of what's arising. That's the actual practice. That means that we're increasing our awareness of the moments of great happiness, um, the highs, the bliss, the joys. And we're also increasing the sensitivity to the lows, to the things that are difficult or painful or hard to experience. We can't increase our sensitivity to just one. We have to increase our sensitivity to everything, to the full range of the human experience. Meditation isn't about getting rid of one half of our experience, the problematic half. It's about opening to the full catastrophe of living. One of my uh, early mentors, a philosopher and meditator named Ken Wilber, he summarized the process of meditation this way and kind of how it unfolds and how it works. He said, it hurts more and then bothers you less. So as we open this sensitivity at first, actually, um, it feels great and it hurts more. There's actually more pain because we're more sensitive. But then as we go deeper, as we start to work with it more, it starts to bother us less. We become acclimatized to the new um, degree of sensitivity. We become more okay with these intense experiences, whether the highs or the lows or everything in between. But here's the thing, when we're feeling pain and when we first start to become more sensitive, that pain can often be overwhelming and unbearable. Um, it can be pain that triggers past hurts from our lives that kind of um, connects with old pains. And when the pain becomes unbearable, when it really taps into a reservoir of deep pain and that we've uh, probably in really smart ways kind of uh, put underground, then um, it can be too much. It can feel too much. And, and the result of that and a kind of the safety mechanism that's built into our psychologies is that we then start to dampen and deaden our experience um, to, those, to that pain. So ironically, meditation can lead us to become more sensitive. But if that sensitivity taps into these deep reservoirs of pain and anguish that are present, then one of the early responses can actually be to dampen or deaden even more to what is happening. And that dampening and deadening could be described in a sense as depression, where we become less aware and less able to experience and everything becomes gray and damp and dark. We feel disconnected. We feel alienated from our own life. That's a protective mechanism, but um, it's one that um, ultimately can lead to some very um, harsh results. 
So there's a wisdom in depression too, okay? That's important. The, the function of dampening these things is actually to protect us. Um, there's a wisdom in depression. But as we open to the pain, there's other ways to work with it than just to dampen it, just to deaden it. That, that's like a first line of defense. Ultimately, what we really need to do is open our hearts to the pain, to feel the pain with compassion, with acceptance, with kindness, with understanding, to feel it without being overwhelmed by it, to trust that there's something in us that can hold even the most excruciating, unimaginable pain. We are capable of holding the pain, not only of our own lives, but the pain of the world itself. That's part of the invitation of deep meditation to invite us into an understanding and an experience of that. When we are able to open in that way, to allow our provisional identities to dissolve, to feel the grieving process, to let go as we feel directly the sorrow of losing something dear, even if it wasn't really totally us or totally serving us. If we're able to open to the anxiety and the fear of kind of coming into contact with how groundless our life situation is and our experiences, how everything is changing moment to moment, is constantly being born and dying. If we're able to open to that and see that the, even the fear and the anxiety, the reactivity to that recognition is itself groundless. If we can open to the pain and the difficulty and to feel it and to open our hearts to it. If we can do all of those things as we start to gain those capacities, which can take a long time and can be quite hard. Um, I don't want to sugarcoat this. This is real. As we do that, we start to gain a greater and greater resilience, a greater and greater capacity to be open to, to be with everything, no matter what it is, how it presents itself, how unpleasant it is. We um, are able to work with the side effects of meditation, which can for some people be quite intense and for other people can be more subtle. Um, however they are, we can start to uh, trust that we can work with whatever arises, that it's workable that um, it isn't totally beyond our capacity. It might be for some period of time, but it is possible to open deeper, to gain a greater insight into not necessarily who we really are, but who we aren't. And by seeing who we aren't, it opens us up into something new that is vaster, that is uh, more able um, to hold more. It's more inclusive. And eventually, this is the weird thing, we start to identify with that, that new open space. Um, and so we go through this process in cycles, in waves. There isn't just one time through these side effects. The side effects of meditation can present themselves time and again. No matter if you're a new practitioner or quite advanced, you can go through phases where the side effects, the difficulties of this powerful medicine um, can cause huge disturbances and disruptions to your life. And as we cycle through the side effects, they're invitations to open more deeply, to become more wise, to become more skillful, um, to have greater compassion for ourselves. And this is the invitation um, of the warning label. The warning label is there. It's important. We need to recognize these things can happen. We need to have plans in place to be able to work with them, to have support structures, to have good guidance. But let's not get, let's not forget that the warning labels are there to help us be aware of what we're going to meet on the path. They're not there to dissuade us from taking the journey. 